Thank you, Richard, and thank you, Mr. President, for that really engaging conversation. Dan Murphy with you again from CNBC, and I'm very thrilled to bring in I'll our next panel okay. and to conduct our there. next conversation. So thank you for sticking around. Joining me on stage <coughs> is His Excellency Mohammed Alabar, the founder and chairman of Emar Properties. We're also joined by David Grover, the group CEO of Roshan, right here in Saudi Arabia. Christian Ulbrich is the global CEO of JLL in the United States. And Barry Sternlich is the co-founder, chairperson, and CEO of Starwood Capital Group, LLC. So welcome into the program. Thanks for joining us. So let's set the scene for this conversation about global real estate and where we are in the cycle right now. The ripple effects, of course, as you all know, of hybrid work have been very substantial. The pandemic has changed how we live, work, and shop. Urban vacancy rates have shot up. Demand for commercial office and retail space in top tier cities has fallen. So are we in a state of crisis? Mohammed Alibar, first to you, your response. Are we at a crisis point? Mm. Well, my, uh, my comment is very simple, really, is that we're such brilliant people. You know, at least I have 30 years of experience in real estate, and I'm sure between all of us, we have, you know, I don't know, 200 years of experience. And, and I just wonder, why do we do this to ourselves? <laughs> like, like, why is it that we're always facing crisis? Right? Like, why? And, 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 and I know it's probably greed, right? Right? It's greed. And, and this, is the, this is a big issue. How can we live and really believe, as very brilliant people, that interest rate will always be 2%? Like, how, right? We know that in life there is day and night and there is summer and winter. But still we just think it will be 2%. We get out of crisis of 2006 and 7 and then you know we get in trouble again. And we don't even think about maybe covid will come. Of course we can't. We don't think of wars, you know. We just think that this thing will just roll and roll. Now, I tell you what we do in the Middle East and in Asia, when you have a problem like that, and I did that in 1997, I went home crying to my mother. There is no one to call. But I think in the West and in, in Europe, you know, the bailout comes in, right? So to answer that first, we blame it, blame it on all of us because we should have planned better. But in reality is that, you know, you've got Corona have added uh, to it and we've changed yeah. our lifestyle, how we look at this. But I think there is a difference that I'm sure my friends from the US, they will, they know better than this. It depends where you are, which city, which location, right? How good is this uh, environment? Because now they call it environments, not even, you know, commercial buildings anymore. Uh, will they really the, the city allow you for change of use? if the floor plate of these buildings can, can work. So it'll be a combination of all that, and there'll be a little bit of pain uh, that investors will have to handle, that banks have to handle uh, to move forward. The only wish I have is that I hope we all learn that in the future, we just kind of minimize this pain. Your Excellency, can I follow up on that? I think it's in absolute fairness, I think it's uh, easy to say, you know, okay, maybe we shouldn't talk about crisis so much, but in your part of the world, Dubai, we've just seen that city leading global luxury sales this year. True. Seems like there's a lot of momentum I'm in scared. the market. I'm scared. I'm scared. Okay, so tell me why. You think it's sustainable? Well, no, it's, you know, Dubai is a very small town, and last year we had about 5,000 uh, millionaires that moved in. And I'm saying, okay, even if the market crashes and there's only this year 2,500 millionaires moves in, we don't really have enough space. We don't have ready homes for all these people. So can you really run your cash flow tight, make sure that you don't deal with your bank and you don't borrow much? Because this is, I mean, real estate is a very unstable business. So uh, this year is looking good. This year is above, we're, we're above 30% uh, above last year. But we have to be careful. We have to be cautious. We know that, that you know, things go up and go down. But for now, it's, it's looking strong. But how can you really manage your cash flow? Just in case if anything happens, you're, you're safe. Mm. All right, fascinating. We might have to come back to that. I wanted to go over to David, though, to give us an insight on what's happening here in Saudi Arabia, and in particular, the projects that you've been working on in Riyadh and in Jeddah, some big capital being deployed in order to basically nation build. 
Yeah, we are, and uh, thank you, and good afternoon to everybody. So um, Roshan is a Saudi-based uh, PIF Giga developer, so we have a different market that we're working into to EMAR, largely anyway. Um, the dynamics of that market are very different. Um, here we have, at the moment, some strong demand in terms of quality um, homes, uh, a desire for a new community way of living, which is relatively new in the kingdom as well. So we see that as strong, as very strong demand in, um, in Riyadh. We've developed a scheme called Cedra. The Cedra is up by the airport in northern Riyadh. It's next to a Roshan front, a big investment we made a few months ago in terms of buying a commercial and retail park. So we're confident about that. We're seeing our products evolve, really good customer feedback. Uh, we're one of the first Giga projects to actually get into the end user as such. So we're actually selling directly to the end user, so that's good. Um, so we're confident with that. We've launched another scheme in Riyadh a few weeks back, um, uh, which is important to us. And then in Jeddah, we're all around the country, by the way. We, it's not just those cities, but if we focus on those two. Then in Jeddah, we um, recently announced a massive canal project. This is hopefully a game changer for, for northern Jeddah. It's, it's a long-term project, but we're starting now in terms of digging the canal. And we're also selling residential just adjacent to the canal live as well, good strong demand there, so we're happy with the way that's going. And then, um, and then we're um, involved in a lot of um, the regeneration of central Jeddah, and that's a long-term project as well, but you, you've got to create the ambition, the excitement, the journey, you've got to articulate it, and also you've got to be conscious of the world changing. So if we, we heard from financial experts, much better than my knowledge, yesterday talking about interest rates and how they're gonna stay pretty stable and relatively high, I'm of the generation where I remember them being double-digit um, inflation uh, interest rates, so I think it's cheap at the moment. Mm. And the world has put up with, or had the luxury of sort of zero to two percent interest rates for a long time. It's not sustainable. So I think we need to be conscious of that. Then also make sure when we're doing our master plans that we're able to speed up and slow down based on the market. The very worst thing is that you oversupply the market at the wrong place in the wrong time. That's detrimental to everybody in the market. And equally, when there is demand there, you need to be able to satisfy the demand. So for us, it's about master planning on a big scale and then breaking it down into manageable chunks so that you can deliver as the market is looking for that support. David, you gave, you, uh, gave me a great stat while we were uh, behind the scenes, and it says mm. everything about Saudi Arabia and the growth rate of this industry and that business. Can you repeat that for me? Do you remember what we spoke about? How many years you've been open and how much... Oh, okay, yeah. Revenue? So, I mean, Roshan's a relatively new company. Under the brand name of Roshan, we've celebrated three years just a few weeks back. So we've gone from literally the first shovel in the ground a couple of years ago into... Um, nearly 3,000 or 2,000 homes completed. We'll have um, a couple of thousand families living in our first community. People already live there. That's from ground up. We've got first um, mosque open, schools are opening, retail's opening um, around, around them. So we're moving fast, and then we're moving at that pace all around the kingdom at the same time. So a bit challenging, a lot of things to juggle in terms of and, and working with the supply chain. There's a lot of um, pressure in the supply chain. We were talking about, Mohammed and I were talking about contractors earlier on about how do you find the right delivery partners, and that's challenging. So we're spending a lot of time delving into the supply chain. So that's uh, windows, doors, concrete, all the materials that come into real estate and trying to partner with Saudi-based companies so we can help them scale, create jobs, increase value to the GDP of the country, but also, um, and then also supply us, of course, which is the important thing. Mm -hmm. All right, let's move it over to uh, Barry, because Barry, I know you had some uh, really interesting comments on CNBC recently. Barry's on CNBC all the time. Um, and you said, the Fed is throwing kerosene on the fire. Rising interest rates are causing a, quote, category five hurricane in the CRE market. Can you expand on that? <laughs> um, I hope people had their lunch. Thanks for having <laughs> me. Um, I'm gonna move out of the Gulf for a second. I mean, it's interesting because those of us who are older, we've been through five cycles. And this is the first one that we didn't really cause. Like real estate is not the issue in, in the world. Most of the asset classes that we invest in, whether it's multifamily, logistics, data centers, student housing, affordable housing, hotels, the underlying fundamentals have been okay. Apartments are 95% occupied in the United States. European apartments are full. There's only really one asset class that is injured at the moment, almost, almost 
permanent injury is U.S. office. Everywhere else in the world, we were talking about our projects in Berlin earlier, they're full and the rents are great. So uh, it's a balance sheet crisis. And my comments about the Fed were, the Fed doesn't seem to really understand the, the makeup of the U.S. labor force today. They're, they're very focused on increasing unemployment and relieving wage pressure. So in order to do that, there's two ways to do that. You can either unemploy people, the people who just got jobs, the, some of the hourly workers in our hotels that we used to pay $15 to, we pay $22 to an hour. Or you can increase the workforce, which in involves letting our immigrants work, increasing immigration, approving visas, approving H-1B visas, and adding millions of people to the labor force that have been knocked off from the pandemic or didn't come for political reasons or pandemic, uh, what do they call them, um, inoculations. Or... So uh, the Fed, our economy was going to slow on its own. The $6 trillion of stimulus packages that were given to American consumers, they've spent it. It's mostly gone. And you can see their credit card balances going through the ceiling. So we were going to slow. On top of that, he decided to really rapidly increase interest rates. And though I agree interest rates wouldn't stay low forever, he's doing this at a pace we've never seen before. We've never seen rates go up this fast. We could absorb slower increases this quickly. After telling us that rates would be lower longer in December of 21, and then, of course, he kept actually easing through May of 22. He was buying corporate bonds. So he pulled a very fast turn. He missed inflation when it was really there because of the lags in the federal data. Our apartment rents went up 20%. We own almost 130,000 apartments in the United States. And he didn't have that in his data. And when rents started to fall, he's now showing the rent increases that were now over a year old. So uh, I don't agree with Larry Fink, and he knows that. I actually think rates will come down in the United States because they'll have to come down. The, you cannot, people who talk about Paul Volcker and say that you know, he is a, is a disciple, Jeremy, uh, Jerome Powell of, of Volcker, that 22% interest rates slowed inflation. Volcker didn't have a $33 trillion deficit. He had a $200 billion deficit. It didn't matter where rates were. But today, the biggest victim of the Fed increasing rates is actually the federal government that now has to pay 5% on $33 trillion of debt, not all of which rolls today. But, and then the second victim are our banks, the regional banks, which have a whole a trillion nine of real estate loans and a huge book of securities that the government told them they didn't have to mark to market, and they have massive unrealized losses in those books. So we're at a dangerous point. Credit is really dried up in the US. Banks don't want to lend. It's a great opportunity for private credit and we do that too. It's a great opportunity for new capital. And Europe's a little better. I mean, Europe uh, obviously has higher interest rates, but the, the asset classes are generally okay. And there are pockets that are wonderful. It's gonna be a great opportunity for investors, but the Fed's gonna to have to relent, in my opinion, because they have no choice. None of the Western democracies can hold rates this high. They can't afford it. You wind up just printing money endlessly to pay interest expense on your deficits. So a coordination of the global central banks to lower rates, it's kind of like it's, it's the wrong side of the, of the, what is it, the ball, the ball gathering moss. The, the unions are out using this wage tightness to get permanent wage increases, which bring inflation on. Um, but on the other hand, we're all trying to lower inflation. And our biggest issue in the United States and the reason the economy remains strong is that we have all these stimulus packages that the government has put together, the CHIPS Act, the, uh, the climate bill, which is really, um, in, they put out over $100 billion in that. You have the trillion dollar construction bill, infrastructure bill, the cumulative impact of which is actually holding up the US economy while private enterprise is getting a little peaked. So you have a tug of war between the federal government spending and the private sector saying, ouch, these interest rates are hurting. And it's really changing things and it will create Future inflation, like we're not building enough homes, nobody will build enough homes with interest rates this high. So it's really, um, the Fed is hurting themselves. And I, I do think we've seen the, the top of rates in the United States. The only wild card is oil. Um, obviously, there's, that, that's something that nobody can really predict, but if oil were to go to $150 a barrel, it would hurt the Western economies again, and that would obviously be inflationary. So other than that, though, inflation should recede, and I think you'll see the Fed, which today you have, you have real, uh, we had negative real, we had free money, 
Now money is extremely tight and extremely expensive. The cost of credit has risen too far too fast. So I'll be more bullish that a year from now, I hope I don't have to not regret saying this, I think the short end of the curve, which in the United States today is five and a half, will be four, um, even tighter than the curve shows. And I think you will see all the central banks will follow the U.S. The banks of the world have to follow U.S. policy because their currencies get eviscerated if they don't. Right. Although Japan went the other way and they're benefiting from that. So I want to know what it all means for the real estate market. And to move it over to you, Christian, your thoughts on this is, is the worst behind us or is the worst yet to come? Well, first of all, we need to be precise around the asset classes. As Barry alluded to, we have big differences amongst the different asset classes. And, and the real issue sits with regards to the asset classes in the offices sector. Now, high interest rates are hurting all asset classes. And so we need a kind of the values to come down and adjust to those interest rate levels. But the demand for the other asset classes is still uh, very, very strong and therefore it should be manageable. On the offices side, that is uh, slightly more difficult. Uh, the question of what is the purpose of an office is debatable, um, and, and therefore we, we have at the moment that uh, unique situation that the best news offices are still uh, achieving new record rents all around the world, while vacancy rates are going up and a lot of offices are obsolete, especially in the US, but not only in the US, you have that situation pretty much all across the Western world, slightly less in Asia. Um, I think for the, the crisis is slightly overstated at the moment because there are still a lot of opportunities, as, as Barry said, um, but uh, there's tremendous risk out there, no doubt. Um, I, I'm not so sure about Barry's comment about interest rates, but if interest rates are coming down, we might face a bigger problem because then we have the, the whole world going into a recessionary environment because otherwise, I think inflation rates will stay pretty high and therefore interest rates will have to stay quite high. And I, the real estate industry has to adjust to that environment. I mean, David said we, we were operating successfully with those type of interest rates easily. I bought my first house and had to pay 8%. Why wouldn't I be able to deal with 6%? Um, but the values have to come down. And so the people who are owning that real estate at the moment, they have to take that pain of values coming down. So Barry called it a balance sheet problem. Yes, we have a balance sheet problem for some companies, but that doesn't mean that the whole industry is in, in, in total kind of crisis mode going forward because for those who have firepower and we have dry powder at the sideline of more than 400 billion at the moment around the globe but that firepower is just not investing at the moment they are waiting for better opportunities and those opportunities will come certainly in in 24. let's do a rapid fire round with about four <clears throat> minutes to go what is going to be the most significant factor for global real estate in 2024 and how do you keep your industry and your businesses match fit for some of these disruptive forces like work from home trends, like hybrid work, like how our changing nature of what work <coughs> is is going to impact office spaces and other sectors within the market. Um, Mohammed Alabar, could you kick us off? Um, I don't know why, I think it's just, I got lucky. I've never been crazy about, about, uh, about offices, so I have not invested a lot. I have office uh, investment, I have retail investment. Uh, but then again, I also don't operate in, in, in the Western environment where, you know, sensitivity to, to, uh, to mortgage or sensitivity to capital invested in office buildings and, and debt raised as a result of that and then interest rate changes. I, I, don't, I don't do that. So majority of what I do is, is in residential uh, mixed use, but a little bit of uh, retail. So 2024, uh, for me, uh, the way things are looking, uh, looks all of our... Uh, in, you know, from East Europe all the way to, to our region uh, looks uh, quite, uh, quite good. But at the same time, as I said earlier, this world is so unstable, you know, you never know what we're going, what's going to hit you uh, next year. So uh, we just, you know, we are very aggressive, we move extremely fast, we have problems in Dubai now with execution just because, you know, the market is going 30% up every year in volume, uh, which we have to handle. But I think just keeping an eye on, on my uh, cash flow. 
David, big risk for 2024, and how do you stay match fit? I think for, let's just talk about offices quickly. In terms of, it's an area we're moving more into at the moment in Saudi. Different dynamic again, perhaps in the market. Lots of startup companies, they need office space. And also for me, there's a lot of the population, the work population is very young. And I think it's really important for you get to my age and you can work remotely a bit more easily, perhaps. But I think in the early part of your career, it's really important to engage with people of your same age group and learn from that experience. And therefore, you need to be co-located in some shape or form. So I think in Saudi, I can see a strong demand. I'm coming through for office space, certainly in the big cities, uh, Riyadh and Jeddah. I think match fit, the biggest challenge for us, and Mohammed will have it as well in Dubai, is the supply chain. I mean, with, it's still off the back of COVID, the world's still struggling with actually getting the right commodities in the right place. And that's causing inflation in, in that market. That drives our prices up, which means our margins go down. So that's a challenge. So I think getting that right, um, for, and also helping the Saudi construction market uh, become a world-class world platform. I think we have a role to play in that alongside all the Giga projects. So I think if we can get that right in the next year or so, then I'm optimistic about 24 and beyond. Hmm. Barry, what's on your radar for the year ahead? Um, the best class in real estate, we're the fourth largest operator in the world of data centers, which um, shocked me. We got there by accident. But that isn't <laughs> as good a business as you've ever seen, as you yeah. heard from His Excellency uh, in his opening remarks. Um, the data world is extraordinary opportunities today. Um, and then f great real estate bought at fixing the balance sheet issues, buying great assets with the wrong balance sheet and providing the rescue capital to fix the capital stacks and getting an attachment point you probably couldn't have seen the last decade. You're seeing, like I just show showed a deal yesterday, there's a brand new property, um, it was, it's in the United States, and the loan is 60% of construction costs, and you own the property if you buy the, get the loan, but you own it 65 cents on the dollar of construction costs, so you have a lot of protection over new supply because they're going to have to come in at full value. Rents will have to go up to justify new construction. So this is a classic cycle. It should be very good for new capital. And you got to protect your old investments to get through this until rates have never stayed. there. You've never had an inverted yield curve forever. So you will see the yield curve do something. Hopefully the long end won't go through the moon and beyond. With our spending, it might. Um, and then all the bets are off. But uh, I think it's going to be a very interesting year, especially if you're patient. It's a, as you said, it's a scary time. And as my friend here, Mohammed Olivar said, you know, this is a time to be cautious. It is, the world is very unstable. And just very quickly, Christian? Yeah, I think the most sustainable trend we see is urbanization, that people are moving into the big cities. And that trend will continue. The biggest asset class of the world is residential. And so that will be um, an ongoing opportunity and, and the interesting piece, it's, it's everywhere, even in those countries where the demography is very uh, unsupportive. Uh, those countries like Japan, like, like many European countries, they have to allow immigration to keep their economy running. And so we will have more people moving into the major cities of the world. And what we have to solve is, is uh, uh, living space which is affordable for people, not only for the 5,000 millionaires, but for the normal people who are doing the work, they need to live somewhere. And so there will be opportunities there, and we will see technology coming into play to provide that type of space at cheaper levels, uh, because that's where the demand is. Okay. Unfortunately, we're out of time, gentlemen, so we'll leave the conversation there. But thank you again for joining me on stage today. Thanks I appreciate so the chat. And ladies thank and gentlemen, you. please thank our guests.